This program is brought to you by Emory University. It is my pleasure today to introduce the, our two uh, faculty members who I think everyone knows, um, Dr. Abi Goyal, who is a professor of medicine and epidemiology. So he has two appointments in School of Medicine and Rollins uh, School of Public Health. He's a chief quality officer and also the co-director of nuclear medicine at uh, EUH, uh, joined by um, Dr. Michael McDaniel, who is my colleague and associate professor, truly inspiring uh, interventional cardiologist who's done some amazing things over at Grady Cath Lab. And I was joking with Michael that I was uh, impressed that he was interested in high sensitivity troponin. <laughs> so I'm curious to, to hear what he has to say about it. Um, so without any uh, delays, I'll turn it over to Dr. Goyal. And I really appreciated the fact that uh, he contacted me and said, hey, I want to do grand rounds. So, uh, you know, all of you, if anybody's interested in presenting, we have lots of open spots for later in the year. So, so please let me know. I'll turn it over to Abhi. Thank you, Pooja, for that uh, introduction. Well, it's a, uh, a privilege and a pleasure to kick off this year's uh, Grand Round series, and it's equally a pleasure and privilege to present with Mike McDaniel. Um, we're presenting on high sensitivity troponin. Uh, I'll be shocked if you haven't heard, but it's going live now in about a week and a half, and we thought it was pretty important to present uh, on this topic. We had a multidisciplinary team at Emory to lead the uh, transition to HS troponin. Uh, Dr. Brixen from Laboratory Medicine and I co-led this effort. We had able input from uh, Mike McDaniel, uh, Michael Balkin, Matt Topol from cardiology, as well as colleagues from emergency medicine and hospital medicine and Shannon Lauer for project management. All of the protocols that we'll be showing, uh, especially toward the end of the talk, are already on the Emory Division of Cardiology website. Uh, and also a YouTube video is also posted on that page, uh, courtesy of our very own Chris Camo. So uh, let's go ahead and get right into it. So this is our outline for the talk. Uh, I'll kick off by presenting differences between high sensitivity troponin and standard troponin. And then we'll speak about myocardial injury versus infarction, which is a really central concept when we're uh, increasing the sensitivity of our assays. And then we'll hand it over to uh, Mike to talk about the ESC 2020 and STEMI guidelines. And he'll then get into data. Uh, does high sensitivity troponin actually improve outcomes in the ED, uh, resource utilization, and most importantly, MACE? And then we'll switch it back to me one last time to actually go through the actual protocols. So this is the evolution of cardiac biomarkers. You can see liver tests were used early uh, back in the 1950s, and then it transitioned to the CK and CKMB uh, isoenzymes uh, in 1970s. The World Health Organization had their first criteria for diagnosing MI, which would later evolve into the universal definition of MI series. Troponin was introduced in 1990, troponin T, and then in 1995, troponin I. And then um, the definition of MI became a little more, uh, it became revised, and the, uh, the uh, first definition of MI came out around that time. Uh, high sensitivity troponin in Europe came out just before 2010, and 10 years later, it finally got cleared uh, by the FDA. So why are we moving now to HS troponin I? Well, we really have no choice uh, because uh, our lab vendors, Beckman Coulter uh, for our legacy hospitals and Siemens for the DeKalb operating unit, they are sunsetting support for standard troponin, and they will only support uh, high sensitivity troponin uh, as of summer of 2022. And so because of our epic transition that is uh, impending, they felt that this would be the time, uh, the lab and lab IT felt this would be the optimal time to make the transition. So in about a week and a half, HS troponin goes live, the standard contemporary troponin and CKMB will no longer be offered. Just to indicate the clinical scale of troponin testing, if you look at EUH, Midtown, St. Joseph's, and Johns Creek, uh, 
from 2019 to 2020, you can see that there were about 305,000 troponin labs ordered across these four hospitals, which is about 150,000 per year. Uh, that's uh, um, most of these, uh, about uh, uh, 180,000 out of the 300,000 are being ordered, uh, about 60% are being ordered in the ED or the CDU. So the scale of this transition is going to be pretty large. Let's spend a little bit of time now looking at differences between HS troponin and standard troponin. All right, first note that the units that we're used to for standard troponin are in nanograms per ml, okay? And uh, the units change when we talk about HS troponin to nanograms per liter. And uh, because of that change in units, you're gonna see, first of all, HS troponin is reported only as integers and the number is a thousand times higher when you're reporting the same concentration. So 100 nanograms per liter for HS troponin is equivalent to 0 0.1 nanograms per ml for standard troponin. So when you start on the wards and you start seeing these numbers, don't uh, fall over your chair when you see values of 100. You just uh, contextualize it and say, well, that's the same as 0 0.1 nanograms per ml for what I'm used to seeing. Okay. The second uh, comment uh, worthy of note is that uh, you'll see that standard troponin had uh, one cut point for the 99th percentile. I'll just remind everybody that by definition, whether you're talking about standard troponin or high sensitivity troponin, uh, abnormal is defined as uh, greater than 99th percentile uh, value when you're taking it in a healthy population. These are not uh, all comers, okay? These are, um, I'm sorry, these are not just people presenting to the ED or the hospital. These are all comers in the community. So if you measure troponin in that population, anyone in the top percentile is considered to have an abnormal value. So for standard troponin, that value was 0 0.04. Anything above that would be flagged in red as abnormal. Now that value gets reduced to all the way down to 15 in women and 20 in men so that there are sex specific cutoffs as shown here, all right? And in addition to that, because of the higher sensitivity and because of the change in the uh, 99th percentile values, you'll note values that were previously reported as uh, within reference range, you know, the equivalent of 15, 20, 30, and even 40, these are now considered above the 99th percentile and they're flagged as abnormal, right? And so, the other comment, the final comment on this slide is that HS troponin uh, has a great precision, particularly at uh, the lower end of the analytic range, which means that you can measure the same sample multiple times and get very similar results, which was not the case for standard troponin. And so because of that, the delta troponin actually becomes a very useful diagnostic tool. The change in troponin from one value to the next becomes very important which we'll talk about uh, shortly. Now with that understanding of HS troponin versus standard troponin, let's remind ourselves about the definition of myocardial injury versus infarction. This is according to the fourth universal definition of MI that came out in 2018. And the de definition of myocardial injury is very straightforward. Any uh, patient who has a troponin value above the 99th percentile is defined as having myocardial injury. All right, and so uh, this injury is considered acute if there's a rise and fall in troponin values, or it's considered chronic if the troponin is elevated and it's uh, relatively a flat trend. But anything above the 99th percentile is injury, and that pertains to whether you're talking about standard troponin or high sensitivity troponin, okay? Now, if you want to take it further to talk about myocardial infarction, an acute myocardial infarction means the patient has evidence of injury plus uh, clinical evidence uh, of overt myocardial ischemia, which means they have symptoms of myocardial ischemia and or diagnostic evidence of ischemia on ECG with dynamic ST changes uh, or uh, ischemia on nuclear stress testing or new wall motion abnormality on echo or a culprit lesion on angiography or CTA. So myocardial injury plus evidence of ischemia equals a myocardial infarction. 
this is a type one and STEMI, which we're familiar with when you have a coronary artery plaque that ruptures or erodes. That's what we call our classic uh, type one and STEMI. Uh, we should keep in mind the term and STEMI should only be used when talking about type one mechanism. Uh, of course, type one STEMI is an acute thrombus uh, that causes a 100% occlusion for which early reperfusion therapy is indicated. This is a type one and STEMI. An interesting aside, in the era of high sensitivity troponin, uh, unstable angina used to be lumped in this term of acute coronary syndrome. Unstable angina is really a vanishing entity as we get uh, so sensitive in our cardiac biomarkers. You almost wonder if that entity even uh, exists anymore when we have high sensitivity troponin detecting minute uh, levels of injury. Uh, type 2 myocardial infarction occurs when there is supply demand mismatch. Uh, this occurs through a variety of mechanisms. Uh, patients can have fixed obstructive coronary disease and then have either a drop in supply of oxygen, either because of acute blood loss anemia or hypoxia, or they can have markedly increased demand, such as hypertensive emergency or tachyarrhythmias, or you can abruptly cut off the supply by vasospasm or um, an embolic event to the coronary artery or SCAD. Um, these are all type 2 MIs. We do not call them NSTEMIs. We call them type 2 MI, and you must document the underlying cause, secondary to an underlying cause. The final broad category here is non-ischemic myocardial injury. These are when the patient has elevated uh, cardiac enzymes uh, above the 99th percentile for troponin and HS troponin, but the mechanism is not ischemic in nature. We do not call these NSTEMIs or type 2 MI. We often see this uh, incorrectly documented as MI due to demand. It's not a demand mechanism. These are not ischemia, uh, and you would want to document the underlying cause. There's quite a lengthy list. Uh, this, uh, the proportion of patients diagnosed with non-ischemic myocardial injury and type 2 MI is only going to increase in the advent of uh, high sensitivity troponins. So we've taken all of uh, the prior slides and synthesized them into one document. You've seen iterations of this over the past uh, four or five years. It's now synthesized under one slide. This is available on the uh, cardiology webpage and it's been distributed uh, fairly broadly. So no need to copy this. You can always contact me as well, but this is on the division of cardiology webpage. Any value above the 99th percentile for troponin or HS troponin is called myocardial injury. Uh, if there is no clinical evidence of overt myocardial ischemia, meaning no ischemic symptoms, no ECG changes, uh, and no echo changes or a culprit lesion, we do not call this an acute MI. You document non-ischemic myocardial injury secondary to an underlying cause. We used to call these non-MI troponin elevation, but that is an outdated term. Actually, as of October 1st of this year, non-ischemic myocardial injury will get its own ICD-10 diagnosis code, and it'll count as a CC or an MCC modifier, meaning a complication of comorbidity or a major complication in comorbidity qualifier on Medicare coding, which increases the level of risk for the patient as well as the reimbursement that the hospital gets. So we'll all have to get used to using this code. There's a lengthy list of things that cause non-ischemic myocardial injury. Acute injury, again, is associated with a rise and fall in enzymes. Chronic injury is flat troponins. This is structural heart disease, uh, chronic PE or pulmonary hypertension. ESRD falls under this uh, side too. Conversely, on the right side, if the patient has evidence of overt myocardial ischemia, then it is an MI, and then we have to determine what type it is. If you strongly suspect acute plaque rupture erosion because of the spontaneous symptoms and because there's no clear precipitant for a type 2 MI, a lot of these patients are going to end up getting a cath, and they're going to be then properly documented as having a type 1 and STEMI, and then you treat per end STEMI guidelines. For type 2 MI, there's often an under, there should be an identifiable, under, un, identifiable but underlying precipitant, and that's where you document the underlying precipitant. We should not call either the non-ischemic myocardial injury, the type 2 MIs, and STEMI, and particularly for the house staff, please note, do not treat these two 
sides, non-ischemic myocardial injury or type 2 MI, we do not treat them with heparin or antiplatelet agents or even send them right to cath because you may be causing harm. And uh, Dr. McDaniel will be emphasizing this as we move forward. When we're talking about injury and infarction, this is a slide from James Januzzi. Uh, Jim uh, is from the Mass General. He wrote a very nice article on Jack in 2019. The point here is that even at very high levels of HS troponin on the order of 1,000 or 10,000 nanograms per liter, which is on the order of one to 10 nanograms per ml for standard troponin that we're used to, there's a broad differential diagnosis, okay? So don't automatically assume that it's an, a type one and STEMI if you see values in the 1,000 range or so, okay? There's still a lengthy differential for, for uh, each of these. But having said that, uh, what we do understand now is that single troponin values, uh, HS troponin values are of limited value in diagnosis, but the change in serial values or the delta troponin is a lot more useful in diagnosis. And a, a general rule of thumb is if you see an ongoing doubling of HS troponin from say zero to three hours to six hours uh, to you know, 11, 12 hours, that raises the concern for type 1 MI and maybe some type 2 MIs that are large, uh, for example, due to SCAD or embolic infarct or severe vasospasm. So the doubling rule, uh, which our lab colleagues have recognized for some time, this is actually a useful rubric to keep in mind diagnostically. With that, I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. McDaniel uh, to talk about the ESC 2020 guidelines. Great, Abby, thanks so much. Um... So we're going to shift gears here. Hope everybody can still see my slides. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the rationale for the algorithms. Uh, Avi's going to walk you through the algorithms at the end here, but we wanted to kind of set the stage of why uh, we're going to why we're proposing what we're proposing. And, and the backbone is going to be a European uh, Society of Cardiology guideline recommended approach. So if there's a if if people are interested, I think it's a good. Um, uh, reference to look at the ESC guidelines um, for non-ST elevation. They have a nice section on high sensitivity troponin. And I think there's a couple reasons to look to the European guidelines. Uh, first, the, the American guidelines are not out yet, although we think the chest pain guidelines will be out shortly. And we think they're going to echo uh, a lot of what the European uh, guidelines show. But also the other reason is that Europe's had more uh, experience with the use of high sensitivity troponin. And so the, the guidelines recommend um, a zero and one hour uh, high sensitivity troponin approach in the emergency department. And so this is gonna be a shift and I'm gonna try to walk you through, but it is a little bit more complicated than what we're used to. So if you think about it, typically when we think about troponins, we think of them in a dichotomous fashion, either being abnormal or normal. We often refer to it being positive or negative. Troponin is negative or positive. We treat people differently. And I think the difference is that we're gonna to have to think about these in a much different way because there's gonna be more variables involved. And so it's not just about being normal and abnormal anymore. And the European approach to this is to try to move from diagnosis to prognosis. And so this is a little bit more about risk assessment than actually diagnosing. And one of the goals and one of the chief goals is to identify patients at extremely low risk. And this is the basically the category that rules out um, myocardial infarction. And, and what is um, the consensus in the ED community is that a rule out should have not, uh, greater than 99% negative predictive value for 30 day MACE. So it's not necessarily making a diagnosis, but you're trying to find out who are the patients who are gonna do fine if you discharge them from the emergency department and let them go have their evaluation in the outpatient arena. And the idea behind high sensitivity testing is that you can go down into the, into the troponin realm into these very low values, not, not normal, below normal, that they become very low. And because of the precision that Avi talked about, that when you do a serial test between zero and one hour, there's essentially no change. So when you see these not normal, but very low values and no change, that identifies low risk. 
Now on the opposite end of the spectrum is identifying those that have the abnormal high values or significant change over time. And the idea behind high is not that it's abnormal, that it's high risk or higher positive predictive value for MACE. Um, so it's not about being abnormal or normal, it's about looking at the, the risk. So um, baseline low, is not the same as normal. So we've got to think differently about normal and abnormal. And high is not the same as abnormal. This is not the same as above the 99th percentile. And then if you're in between low and high, then that means you're intermediate. And this is the group that's gonna need probably more testing. So a little bit complicated. So this is the ESC guidelines. And I wanna show you a couple uh, things in here. So. One of the reasons that this becomes complicated is that each different vendor who makes high sensitivity troponin, they have different values for what is considered normal and abnormal. And I'm gonna walk you through this in just a minute with another study that highlights this. But we have to start to think differently. Instead of thinking about just the cutoffs for 99th percentile, in the emergency department, we have to think about other cutoffs now. We introduce these new concepts of having low cutoffs, which are near the levels of detection, or high cutoffs that then increase your positive predictive value for uh, MACE and, and myocardial infarction. So a little bit different. The other part that makes this complicated is there's a new variable that we really haven't spent a lot of time thinking about or quantifying in the past, and that's the delta. And Avi really talked about the importance of high sensitivity troponin and the deltas over time. Um, we're going to truncate the time from testing down from the old 0, 3, 6, down to 0 and 1 with an optional three hours. So we're going to be looking at the deltas now in between these times. And not only that, you have to know the time between the samples. And there are different delta values at one hour than there are for two hours. So there are new variables. And so what instead of now being a dichotomous, abnormal, normal, positive, negative, we now have a low value. We have a 99th percentile for men that's considered abnormal. We have a different 99th percentile for women that's considered abnormal. There's gonna be a high value. And then there's gonna be delta values that are low and high at one hour and low and high at two hours. So complicated, um, but we're gonna walk you through this at the end, but this is the rationale for use in the European approach. Now, a couple words about our system. Grady and the Emory legacy sites use the Beckman Coulter assay. And when you look at the European guide, they have some recommended um, values for these cutoffs. Um, this has been uh, uh, derived from a cohort of patients that show that this performs very well with a uh, very good negative predictive value at the low range and very good positive predictive value at the high range. But in the uh, Emory Decatur sites, um, there is a different assay, and that is the Siemens assay. And the important point is, is that some of these values are going to be different, or, or many of these values are actually different with this different assay. And, and, and so the point is, is as our patients transfer between healthcare systems or hospitals, um, they, uh, you can't follow trends over time uh, for different assays. And this um, study recently uh, published in Jack, I think highlights this. And so it's a really important caution as we look at high sensitivity troponin use and they're coming into the, uh, the Atlanta region. Many hospitals outside of uh, the Emory and Grady systems are using these already. So we, we have to be aware of this limitation. This is a nice study over a thousand patients. And then they sent these blood samples for analysis on the different high sensitivity troponin analyzers. And they looked at whether it was at the limits of detection or the 99th percentile and then how this you know, impacted clinical practice. Were you ruling them out, ruling them in or observing them? And the bottom line is, is about a quarter of the time, you're gonna lead to differences in the way we treat our patients and the way we risk stratify our patients to ruling them out or ruling them in um, based on 
the analyzer that's selected. So patients who go to Emory Decatur emergency room, there's a 25% chance that they're gonna be treated differently than if they went down the, the, the road to the opposite direction towards Emory University Hospital. And that's gonna be the same, it, it's true in uh, some of the you know, other uh, healthcare systems in town that use multiple different analyzers. So the takeaway is you can't follow trends over time with different hospitals that use different analyzers. So when we look at the uh, records from other hospitals, we have to know what they're using. So it's an important limitation. Now, what about outcomes? I wanna just speak briefly and then we really wanna get into the algorithms. Um, but I wanted to speak specifically about the ED throughput the resource utilization for cardiologists and then the impact on major adverse events for patients. So ED throughput, first a word about this. So the reason to move to this zero one hour um, algorithm is, is probably obvious is that we've truncate the time to diagnosis that you, you, you move it down and usually within a one hour period of sampling now, you can make a, uh, a, a risk assessment for a patient. And what we see is that uh, in real world experiences of patients with acute chest pain, that you can end up taking almost two thirds of your population and it by one hour of home without any more testing, no CDU admissions, they do great and they have very low MACE rates. Well, what about cardiologists and, and resources is I was getting uh, into that I was very worried about the impact that this was going to have on us. And as we were looking at this, we did, um, uh, there, there was a nice uh, series of articles that was published in Jack that helped us kind of give some guidance here. So I want to spend just a minute looking at some of this. So there's a in the Boston area, um, their healthcare system ended up transitioning to high sensitivity troponin, and they ended up publishing the results of, you know, how did it impact uh, utilization of care in over 7,000 patients? So I want to walk through this because I think there's important things that people are probably thinking about right now listening to this. So first of all, there's more troponins that are gonna be drawn. We already draw a lot, but it looks like there's gonna be even more troponins. And so this may uh, be some uh, increased resource utilization for phlebotomy and for our laboratory colleagues. Now, interestingly, there was less use of cardiac medications after high sensitivity troponin came in. I, I don't have a great reason, uh, re reason for this, but I'm gonna show you why it may be at the end when I show you a caution. Now, this is the big thing, because I was surprised about this. And I think we all were, is that there was actually less consultation for cardiology and less admissions for cardiac reasons after the advent of high sensitivity troponin. I thought all this myocardial injury uh, increase would end up uh, overwhelming cardiology, but it actually seemed to have the opposite impact, at least in the Boston uh, area. And we'll have to see if that's true in our healthcare system. Now there was more EKGs performed, uh, probably for the same reason that there's more troponins that were performed. But when we looked at the non-invasive testing in cardiology, there was really no impact on echo use, which was a little bit surprising to me. And interestingly, less stress testing and less cardiac CT angiography. And that surprised me, but I think what we're seeing is, is that hopefully if this is working, that there are less patients going to the CDUs and observations and being admitted for chest pain and they're going straight home without any further testing. I think that's what's going on uh, with this data. And then there's uh, really was no impact on revascularization procedures uh, with the admins. Now, um, in that same um, article in Jack, same a manuscript in Jack, the Wisconsin group published their, their findings and they had similar things. So ECHO, pretty similar uh, pre and post implementation of high sensitivity troponin, stress testing, again, less for those same reasons, but they did find an increase, uh, about a 40 to 50% increase in invasive angiography. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of word of caution about this at the end here. So we think it improves ED throughput, decongests EDs, 
increase, decreases length of stay and increases the number of patients that are discharged. And we don't think it's hugely impacting the utilization of resources for us in cardiology. Well, what about our patients? Are they doing better because we're going to bring this in? So there's a lot of data that we could show you. It's a very complicated topic to go through all the, the, the literature on here. Um, and um, I, we can't show you at all. I'm just going to highlight two studies. But the, the important takeaway is that these are all done in, in all these randomized trials have been done in Europe. And one of the caveats that we always have to think about is that there are some significant differences in healthcare um, in, in, uh, in European countries than in America and whether there's differences in the reimbursement structure or the medical legal climate, that it's always unclear if we can take the lessons um, from these different healthcare systems and whether they'll apply here in America. So with that though, I do think it's worth showing this data. So one of the big trials that I think has gotten a lot of attention is the historic trial. It was recently published and presented and the, the strength of it is its size. Over 31,000 patients randomized. And they had a randomization towards sort of what's the old standard pathway of zero six hour troponins versus what's considered a um, early um, rule out pathway of zero and three hour uh, troponins. And what they found not surprisingly, is that if you use these high sensitivity troponin uh, algorithms, they used a zero three in this study um, that they discharged more patients from the emergency department based compared to standard protocols. And they did so with uh, very low uh, MACE rates and, and myocardial infarction and death rates at one year. So it's not saving lives. We're not identifying patients and treating them better with high sensitivity troponin, but at least in this very large cohort, it doesn't seem to be harmful and it is sending patients home sooner. So the reason to do this is a, a resource utilization in the emergency department um, and that's the big benefit. Now, a word of caution, because another uh, recently um, published study had a little bit different um, message here, the rapid TNT. And this is an interesting trial because it's really a randomized trial of the way we do things today versus the way we're gonna do things on September 22nd. And if you think about it, standard care, the way we practice today, none of us have ever seen a troponin less than zero. 0.03. Remember, we're going to chain our, change our units. So this is the equivalent of a high sensitivity component of 30. So no one, none of us have ever seen a value less than 30. We're blind to values below 30. On September 22nd, we're going to get values below 30. And so the question is, is when you give doctors information about low values, do they make better decisions for their patients? And that was what this randomized trial was. They either kept the doctors blind to the information or they gave them the information and let them see if they can do better for their patients. And what they found is that in this group of patients with these low values is that actually the outcomes were worse when we gave doctors this information. Um, and they had higher rates of death in MI at one year. So important, um, message to take away. So I think we have to dig into this a little bit and say, why would that be? So again, this was a randomized trial of the European zero one hour algorithm. And so the, this is the goal is to put into three buckets. Well, when you look at the low risk buckets based on the, um, the, their approach, what they found is it did exactly what you anticipate it would do. You would increase the number of patients that you would discharge directly, you would decrease the length of stay, and you identified a very low risk group that did great. So when you have this low risk group identified by high sensitivity troponin, you can safely discharge them, reduce the length of stay, and these patients are gonna do fine without any further testing. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum, when you risk stratify them into a higher risk group, well, our current troponins detect these values um, of high risk and the future troponins will also detect it. So it shouldn't surprise us that actually this group is gonna be treated the exact same because we found them, they were abnormal before and they're gonna be abnormal um, 
you know, in the future. So when you look at admissions, heart casts, and outcomes, they're similar with current opponents and future high sensitivity opponents. So this group does the same. Where the interest is, where the caution is, is in this intermediate group, because this is the group that we're going to treat differently based on these new values. And this is where we have to be a little bit cautious. So what they found in, in this intermediate range group, well, now there's some new definitions of normal and abnormal in this range here. And what they found is in this group that when you ran, when they got randomized to the high sense speech opponent, there was more discharges. There was less stress testing or functional testing. There was more invasive angiography and revascularization. And this combination of factors was strongly, um, was a strong trend towards worse death and MI in the next year. So why is this? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is this could all be the play of chance. This is a smaller study, much smaller than historic. And this all could just be noise and subgroup analysis. So you have to take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. But there could be some other messages that are going on here. And one is it may be that we're doing too little non-invasive testing in some of these patients. And maybe that's why we saw in the Boston that we weren't identifying coronary disease and putting them on the medications for cardiovascular disease that could reduce future events. It could also be that we weren't using risk scores in this study. And we're going to show you as Avi walks through the um, algorithms. Uh, a rationale for using the heart score. And it also could be that there's too much invasive angiography and revascularization. Certainly some of those events that we were seeing in this trial started at the six month mark and could these be uh, stent related um, events that were uh, not necessary. And so I think it's a real important uh, takeaway is that we have to remember that studies that show the benefits of an early invasive approach in acute coronary syndromes they do not apply to a high sensitivity troponin era. And, and certainly over the last decade, we've had it creep into more and more sensitive troponins. And that has really changed the positive predictive value for what we find in the cath lab. And I think the authors had a really good warning to us. And they said, coronary CTA or other non-invasive testing should be considered in mildly elevated myocardial injury so that we uncouple the diagnosis of, of coronary disease and the impetus uh, to revascularize. So with that, I'm gonna turn this back over to Avi and uh, let him walk you through the algorithms now that we've got the rationale. Thanks, Michael. That was uh, terrific uh, um, data in terms of uh, the background behind our thinking of these protocols. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, I just wanted to point out that we were very evidence-based in our approach to the protocols. We looked at a number of documents, only few are listed here. We looked at guidance documents, fourth universal definition of MI, the ESC 2020 guidelines. We looked at the package inserts from the vendors that have a lot of useful information. We looked at the laboratory literature uh, and we looked at uh, published assays already. In addition to that, we reached out to a number of centers that have already implemented these tests. Now, just a quick disclaimer, anytime you look at protocols with specific numbers in them, you have to know what is the um, analyzer that is being used. Um, and so uh, we use the Beckman Coulter Unicell DXI analyzer at uh, Grady and at uh, EUH Midtown St. Joseph's Johns Creek. This, the protocols with the numbers shown here do not apply to UWASH or Decatur or DeCab operating unit that use different uh, analyzers. Uh, we have separate protocols for them that are published on the cardiology website. And in the interest of time, we're only gonna show the ones for Grady and the four legacy sites here, okay. Before we actually talk about that, we do need to just remind everyone what the heart score is. Our ED colleagues live and die by the heart score. In chest pain patients, we rarely use this. We don't use this actually in cardiology and on the floors, but the heart score is a risk stratification tool used for patients presenting with chest pain in the ED. Each of the letters stands for um, part of the score, history, E is ECG, A is age, risk factors, and troponin. 
and each of these components is scored from zero to two, uh, zero being if it's not consistent with uh, a concern for acute coronary syndrome or NSTEMI, two if that component is concerning. And so the total heart score ranges from zero, which is very low risk, to 10, which is a very high pretest probability uh, for an acute coronary syndrome. So with that, this is the ED protocol. It's a busy slide. Uh, I don't want us to get caught up in numbers per se, but I want to highlight a few things. Okay, first of all, this is an ED protocol. There is a separate protocol that I'll show on the next slide for inpatients. And we felt that there needed to be two different protocols, one for the ED and one for the inpatient setting because the goals of care are different. In the ED, they have two main goals of care stabilize the patient, and then risk stratify the patient so that they can triage the patient properly. This low risk group here uh, consists of those patients that uh, Mike had mentioned would fall under the less than 1% risk of 30-day MACE. Those are the low risk patients who could then uh, be safely considered for discharge and follow-up. Um, conversely, on this side, you have the high risk patients uh, who should be considered for cardiology consultation and or admission. And then you have the intermediate group uh, who are really, this is what CDUs are designed for in terms of observing them and stress testing or doing CTAs, et cetera. The other broad comment I'll make is that this is not just a troponin protocol. It is a clinical protocol. Uh, the reason that's important is you'll find in the literature and in some guidelines, chest pain protocols that are purely troponin based. We as a group felt, however, that uh, we had to keep in mind that troponin, even HS troponin, is only one tool in our toolbox for diagnosis. And we have to give uh, equal and due consideration to the patient's symptoms and to the ECG findings. And so you'll see this protocol synthesizes the patient's symptoms the duration of symptoms, their ECG findings, the heart score, the troponin, and the delta troponin. So if a patient presents with chest pain, their presenting ECG shows um, that they meet STEMI criteria, you immediately follow the STEMI protocol. If they don't meet STEMI criteria, but they have new acute signs of ischemia like dynamic ST segment changes, then that also puts them automatically in the high risk bucket. Okay, troponins at that point are secondary. If, however, you have uh, ECG that does not show significant ST deviation, that's when you start the cascade in the ED of drawing troponins at zero and one hour initially, and then later they have the option to draw the third hour. Okay, this low risk group you'll see here is if they've had uh, troponins that are, as uh, Mike pointed out in his ESC slides in the very low range. Okay, so this is the Beckman culture assay. Again, the cut points for abnormal are 15 in women and 20 in men, all right? And so 15 and 20 is the equivalent of 0 0.015 nanograms per ml, which is currently um, uh, undetectable or you know, the below the limit of quantitation for our standard troponin assay and 0 0.02 for men. So you're talking about values for this low risk range that are less than five nanograms per liter, way below the 15 and 20 cut points. This is 0 0.005 nanograms per ml. So it's very low, it's not just low. Okay, so if they have very low troponins and their delta troponin is also less than five nanograms per liter, then they fall under this low risk bucket. If at any point their troponin exceeds 100 nanograms per liter, they're put in this high risk bucket, or if they have deltas that are above 15 or 25. Everyone else falls in this middle category of intermediate risk, and these will be patients who get stress tests, et cetera. So about 60 to 65% of patients presenting with chest pain we anticipate would fall under this low risk. We will be following them up prospectively. We're um, having some meetings with uh, Arshed Kayumi, who's on this talk, uh, to figure out how we can prospectively study uh, some of these protocols. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the, that's the ED protocol. We'll shift. I do want to, one final comment. Our ED colleagues, I was initially concerned about uh, their use of HS troponin. 
they're actually more evolved than we are in cardiology. They've been chomping at the bit and following this literature and data for like three, four years. And so to my surprise and delight, they, you know, we were initially considering troponin above 50 to be high risk, which is 0 0.05 nanograms per ml. And they said, you know what, push it out to 100 nanograms per liter or 0 0.1 nanograms per ml, because we want more latitude to call them intermediate risk and to stress test them. And, you know, that actually, I think, is a kudos to our ED teams for recognizing that single values of troponin are really not very diagnostic. You want to follow them for the deltas and often supplement it with uh, non-invasive testing. And I think this protocol, therefore, overcomes some of the shortcomings that uh, Mike uh, very ably discussed from the rapid TNT trial. And so hopefully we av avoid those pitfalls and we avoid uh, doing too many uh, unnecessary invasive procedures on this intermediate risk group. This is the inpatient protocol. Um, like the ED protocol, it is uh, a um, clinical protocol. It synthesizes more than just troponins. It looks at the chest pain, the quality and duration of the chest pain. It looks at ECG findings. And then it also, of course, looks at troponins and the delta troponins. So if a patient presents with chest pain and it sounds ischemic and the ECG meets STEMI criteria, you follow the inpatient STEMI protocol. Troponins at that point are moot. Uh, conversely, off to the left here, if the chest pain does not sound ischemic and the ECG does not show acute ischemia, we encourage providers to not even order an HS troponin because if it's mildly positive, you're gonna be scratching your head, what do I do with this? Um, all right, and so these are patients who don't have myocardial ischemia if they don't have the symptoms or the ECG findings consistent with ischemia. Now, everyone else who has either uh, ischemic chest pain or ECGs falls under the troponin bucket. That's when you start the cascade. Unlike the ED protocol, which is a zero, one, and three hour protocol, the inpatient protocol is zero, three, and six hours. If at zero and three hours, your troponins are both within the reference range, less than 15 in women and 20 in men, uh, and the delta is small, then they do not have myocardial injury. They may have underlying myocardial ischemia because they did have ischemic sounding chest pain to get to this point or ECG changes. Uh, and it's reasonable to do cardiac imaging stress testing that can potentially be deferred to an outpatient basis, but they don't have myocardial injury and therefore don't have a myocardial infarction. If they have both within the reference range, but the delta is above five, that's when we'd say repeat the troponin. And if all of those are negative, again, they don't have injury, they may have myocardial ischemia, consider stress testing. If at any point a troponin exceeds 15 for women or 20 for men, then it's consistent with myocardial injury. And that's where we move to this next slide that I already showed previously. Uh, it's a segue into this where you have to consider, do they have signs and symptoms of ischemia? If no, it's non-ischemic myocardial injury. If yes, it's an acute MI. And then you have to type it, type 2 MI or type 1 and STEMI. So the final conclusions then, uh, as we roll out these new protocols, men and women have different cut points. Above 15 uh, nanograms per liter is above the reference range for women and above 20 is abnormal for men. Different hospitals will have different cutoffs because of the different analyzers they use. Thankfully, EUH, Midtown, St. Joseph's and Johns Creek, as well as Grady Memorial Hospital all use the same analyzer and all have the same cut points. Um, the ED protocol is zero one uh, with an optional three hours and the goal there is risk stratification and triage. The inpatient protocol is zero, three, and six hours, and the goal is to accurately diagnose uh, the type of myocardial injury or myocardial infarction and treat accordingly. Again, for this, we do not treat non-ischemic myocardial injury or type 2 MIs with heparin, antiplatelet therapy, or early invasive therapies. If we do that, that might increase the risk of uh, harm and increased complications, which could be a contributing factor to the worst outcomes in rapid TNT that Mike showed. Uh, myocardial injury does not equal myocardial infarction. You need to have ischemia in conjunction with myocardial injury or elevated troponin to call it an MI, and then you have to type the MI. 
And then finally, HS troponin may improve ED throughput. It probably has a neutral impact on MACE. It does not improve heart outcomes. And the verdict is still out on downstream testing and cardiology consults based on US practice and based on what we'll see at Emory. So with that, we'll uh, open it up to questions. Uh, and we thank you very much for your uh, uh, participation. Thank you so much, uh, Avi and uh, Mike. That was just absolutely fantastic. And, uh, you know, these grand rounds are recorded and they will be available because I have a feeling that we're going to, uh, everyone is going to want to reference these. And uh, can you just review with us where all can these documents be found? And the second question is for our residents, fellows, hospital medicine colleagues, surgical colleagues, we're always ordering troponins because often it's not us who end up ordering them. We just get consulted on them. So what is being done to kind of uh, educate the people who are always ordering these and then calling us? Great, uh, so great questions. Um, let me take the first one first about where can we find the protocols? I'm gonna share my screen again and show you how you can access them, okay? Uh, can you see um, my screen? Yes. Uh, okay, can you see, I've opened up a browser here. Um, can you see that? Yes. Okay, if in the URL bar you just type, uh, let's try this again, you type Emory um, Division of Cardiology, okay? Uh, it opens up here. The second link is Division of Cardiology, Emory School of Medicine. If you click on that link, there's Dr. Taylor. You go off to the right of the screen, okay, where we have a number of links, cardiology research fellowship programs. Note that Chris Kamau has created a link for high sensitivity troponin protocols. Great. You click on that link, it opens up a page. And it reminds everyone that on September 22nd, all EHC hospitals are graded with transitioning. This is a YouTube video. If you click on this, it'll open up a video of less than 10 minutes that just talks about the protocol part uh, that I covered at the very end. All right. And then, um, uh, and then down here are the high sensitivity troponin protocols. If I click on, for example, EUH Midtown St. Joseph's Johns Creek, it pulls up um, give it a second to think. There, it pulls up the clinical protocols for Grady and uh, EUH Midtown St. Joseph's Johns Creek. It's a seven page document. It gives one page background. It gives this table of equivalencies uh, with the abnormal cut points, the ED protocol, the heart score, the inpatient protocol, and this uh, one page chart version of myocardial injury, non-ischemic MI type one, type two MI. All right, so you can find that for any of the hospitals uh, within the Emory system by going through those steps. So even if you type instead of Emory division cardiology, if you just type Emory cardiology, you can find the division link on that first page, the first Google page and it'll go there. Okay, great. So we have some questions in the chat. Uh, so the first question is uh, coming from Dr. Hill. She's, she's asking, uh, how does, uh, yeah. uh, how does uh, demand ischemia fit into all this? So, so let me ask this, answer the second question that was raised earlier in terms of HMS and all of these other services that order yes. troponins. We probably have, um, uh, have already given an in-service uh, and we'll be giving more in services so that by the time of rollout, we'll have literally given this talk or, or had an in service to probably about, about 20, 25 times. That includes to HMS, all of the different sites. They have access to these protocols. Two of our members on this were uh, HMS um, members for the protocols. They've also, uh, prom they've also disseminated this. Uh, we've presented this to KP Cardiology. Dr. Balk and I are presenting this to KP Internal Medicine. Uh, we're hitting family medicine at Midtown. Our surgery colleagues, um, I'm hitting uh, this week, uh, not hitting, I'm, uh, uh, I am uh, uh, communicating with them. 
We've gone through a hundred different power plants that currently have troponin embedded in them. And we have taken a lot of those troponins out. So you can't just order them willy nilly. We've created, you're not seeing screenshots of that yet because they're still fervishly working on them uh, at Lab IT. But we've basically removed troponin from a lot of the order sets and said, if you want to order this, your patient has to have ischemic symptoms. Okay. And then you can order the uh, troponin power plan for zero and three hours in the inpatient and an optional six hours. So, uh, and we got buy-in largely from, um, you know, HMS and, and cardiac surgery and the Emory Center for Critical Care and all of these services to do that. And so, um, uh, you know, there were four big components to this transition, uh, two of which you've sort of been aware of, the development of the clinical protocols and education. The other two big pieces of this are all the work that happened in the lab with method verification and lab testing, uh, and also with lab IT. You know, so any big lab transition like that has, you know, four major parts to it. Uh, method verification in the lab, lab IT, developing your clinical protocols and education. And so um, I think uh, all of them have been completed or will be complete by the time we go live. Okay, great. Uh, I know we're past 8.30, but we started a little bit late uh, because of the link confusion. So I'll just, uh, we'll just keep going. Uh, there are two questions in the link. Uh, so if we could uh, address those. So where does demand ischemia fit into all this? Uh, so Hillary is our CDI reviewer. Thank you, Hillary, for keeping us honest. Um, demand ischemia right now is an ICD-10 code. It is a mechanism by which type 2 MI occurs, okay? So if a patient has elevated troponin and you think the patient has supply demand mismatch or demand uh, ischemia as a mechanism, please call that a type 2 MI don't just call that demand ischemia because they have an infarct if their troponin is elevated. Demand ischemia, like unstable angina, is probably a vanishing term in and of itself. You know, demand ischemia without troponin elevation probably doesn't really exist when you're in the era of high sensitivity troponin, uh, but it is an ICD-10 code. If I guess a critically ill patient had ischemic sounding chest pain and their SDs dropped, but for some bizarre reason, their HS troponin didn't bump above uh, the reference range, then I guess you would call that demand ischemia. Um, uh, Mike, do you have any comments on uh, any of the questions so far? No, I, I think that's... Okay. That. Dr. Casamatis asked a question. Uh, will this impact our ability to occasionally order an outpatient troponin level? Um, no, you will still be able to do that. We did not instruct lab IT to disable ordering uh, as an outpatient. I really hope that happens infrequently. Uh, I know that our heart failure colleagues may do that sometimes for amyloid. And I guess if a cardiologist does it, uh, that probably is okay. But if you're concerned enough to draw an outpatient troponin level for symptoms, they probably should be going to the ED. Uh, Dimitri, you're, you're on the chat. Go ahead and uh, you know open up your... Uh, audio and just let us know what you're thinking in terms of why you'd be interested in open ordering this as an outpatient. Oh, thanks, Avi. And, um, and just fantastic job. Again, you skipped that first thing that I wrote. This is a tremendous workload that you and Michael have done here. Just really thank you. And uh, so it, to what I was saying is very occasionally, you know, a couple times a year, maybe I might order from the clinic uh, a troponin in somebody that I am I'm convinced that their pain clinically is something non-cardiac uh, and I just want to make absolutely sure without sending them through the emergency room, for example. Um, so in addition to you know the EKG and the clinical story, I, I will sometimes, when they're going to the lab, have them get a troponin. So it's an instance like that. And then occasionally, like you said, it might be because you're monitoring a known condition that you already expect their troponin to be elevated and you want to see where it is now. Yeah, that's, that's fair. And I know you're one of the most uh, thoughtful documenters in our section, and you would undoubtedly document, you know, rationale for this. And those, those sound very reasonable. Uh, we have not broadly advertised that you can order this as an outpatient, <laughs> as you can see, uh, but uh, I mean, your, your rationale is very sound. And so that's, that's good. 
Hey, uh, Abby, this is Jonathan hey. Kim here. Uh, just a quick jump in on the outpatient troponins. Um, for those familiar in our work with COVID-19 and athletes and potential cardiac injury, I order a ton of outpatient troponins. So, um, and, and that's uh, the rationale behind that's becoming much more limited, thankfully, as we update our guidelines. But um, for the indefinite future, uh, I will likely still be ordering some of these as an outpatient as well. Great. Be very curious mm -hmm. to hear what you... Uh learn, you know, with the advent of HS troponin, um, you know, that's going to open up uh, avenues in terms of what you're learning, I'm sure. Uh, There's a question from uh, Steve Linderman. Uh, it looks like all the delta high sensitivity troponin measures are not normalized by baseline values. So for example, a change in someone with chronic uh, MI, you know, injury going from 55 to 60 doesn't seem as concerning as a change from 10 to 15. So any comments on that? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great comment, uh, and uh, Dr. Linderman is correct. Um, I'm going to share my screen again for a second and just go back to um, the uh, uh, protocol slide here, okay? Um, for example, in the ED here, if a patient goes, for example, from 10 to 15, that delta is more than five. That automatically puts them in the in intermediate risk. That patient who started at 50 or 55 and goes to 60, on presentation, they're also intermediate risk, one for the delta and one because their initial troponin was already in that range. But yes, the, the beginning value does matter, okay? And that's why earlier in the talk, um, we made the comment that a good rule of thumb is the doubling rule. Like if you start out at 10 and that goes to 20, that's a lot more concerning than if a patient starts out with end-stage kidney disease, they start out at, uh, at um, 70 and they go to 80, right? And so that delta does have to be taken into context with your baseline. And that's why a lot of our lab colleagues and, and uh, clinicians um, who are used to troponin, the doubling rule is very useful, that if you're getting troponins over zero and three and six hours, et cetera, that are doubling, that's much more consistent with acute injury. And if it continues to double, then that's, that's concerning potentially for a type one and STEMI uh, or a large type two MI. So yes, absolutely. That's a, that's a good comment. The only other thing I'd like to just add to that is that, um, you know, that we're all new to using high sensitivity troponin and there's a lot, lot of new variables that we're um, going to be, you know, getting used to. And so, you know, the plan is that this is sort of, this is our first protocol, but not the final protocol. And we will continue to evolve uh, over time. And so we welcome anybody's input, you know, as we roll this out, if you see things that we can make this better, that's, you know, please reach out to us. We'll definitely be meeting periodically to make this algorithm better and stronger. That's, that's uh, an excellent point, Mike. Uh, we will be reaching out to a number of you who are on the words over the first month and let us know how this is performing. We'll be very interested to hearing your comments and we'll be doing a lot of chart reviews to just get an idea. Um, and uh, a special thank you to those who are on the wards and in the units uh, for the first week of go live. We appreciate all of you. Uh, and um, I'm sure I'll certainly be on service within a few weeks of go live and we'll be eager to see how this performs. Um, I have a quick question about therapy. So it, it sounds like, you know, it, it may be clearer to figure out when to avoid heparin, you know, starting heparin or antiplatelet or sending people to the cath lab. But then for people that have lower levels of, you know, high sensitivity troponin, and you think it's more ischemia and not necessarily injury, if we get consulted, is there enough data to go ahead and say aspirin, beta block, or statin, uh, you know, for the preventive strategies? Where are we with that? Because I feel like that's where some of the confusion may also be um, in terms of when to go ahead and recommend the preventive therapies. Yeah, I mean, I could j jump in. I mean, I, I think that really it comes down to, as a clinician, what you think the diagnosis and reason for myocardial injury is. And so, you know, if you think they have coronary disease, either because you know it or, you know, high suspicion, uh, then that's where these therapies will shine. Um, I think the most of your benefits uh, uh, for... Uh, 
for the acute management is gonna come those in patients who have true ACS, which is a pretty limited population of the group of myocardial injury. Also, if in the scenario you raised, Pooja, if the patient has, I think you said negative or low troponins, but their symptoms are concerning for ischemia, Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's the role then for stress testing or CTA or even a calcium mm -hmm. score. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I would posit that if you're not, if you don't have clear documentation of ischemia, et cetera, you probably don't need the cadre of all of those medicines. I mean, of the four you mentioned, right, um, statin is probably the one if they have underlying coronary disease, we know benefits. Aspirin is... Uh, uh, risking preaching to the choir here because you are all more um, probably in tune with the prevention literature on aspirin than I am at this point. But, you know, aspirin is controversial for those who don't have, you know, established coronary disease. And, you know, that's becoming a little less favored. Beta blocker is really indicated only if you have MI or heart failure, et cetera. And even now, you know, beta blockers may not be useful beyond um, the initial year or two if you've had a documented MI, because a lot of these MIs are probably not transmural MIs that were diagnosed, you know, 20 years ago when we had CKMB and Q waves and all that, you know, an MI now is very different from an MI 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and, um, you know, so if in that patient, it's probably going to be about statin, blood pressure control, um, you know, blood sugar control, not necessarily secondary prevention medicines unless you can clearly document that on non-invasive testing. Mm -hmm. Right. All right, thank you everyone for joining and don't forget to uh, get your CME yeah. credit and I will see you uh, next week. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.